Hello, welcome to my lecture on chapter six. In chapter six, we're gonna be talking all about viruses. And first, we're just gonna do an overview. Then we will talk about the general structure of viruses and get, and then we'll get into how they're named and classified. Then we'll start talking about the way that viruses multiply and talk about multiplication cycles in bacteria or the multiplication of bacterial phages. Then we will talk about how viruses can be cultivated and identified. And we will finally talk about viral infections, detection, as well as treatment in humans. And then the very last part of this section, we'll be talking about prions and viroids that are other and other non-viral infectious particles. We'll be splitting this lecture across several video files. So the thing about viruses is that they are much, much smaller than the other infectious agents that we have talked about so far. They're smaller than bacteria, fungal, and then also um, protists and animal um, infectious agents. So even though the light microscope was developed in the late 1600s and we were able to look at other types of cells, viruses are so small that it wasn't until the invention of an electron microscope that viruses could actually be viewed. And so at one time, viruses like polio and smallpox and rabies and some of the viruses that infect plant crops as well as animals in agriculture were known to be caused by something that could be transmitted from one organism to another but the cause itself was not known. So there was a lot of research and experimentation that was being done trying to figure these things out. And there were people like Pasteur and Ivanovsky and Bejerink who were looking into these disease-causing agents. But it was not till much, much later that it was sort of pinpointed what was causing these diseases. So in the late 1800s, Louis Pasteur came up with the idea that rabies was caused by a living thing that was smaller than a bacterial cell. And then you had people like Ivanovsky and Bejerink who were looking at the tobacco mosaic virus. And it was Ivanovsky who actually came up with the term virus, which meant poison in Latin. And they showed that that tobacco mosaic disease was caused by a virus in the late 1800s is when they did their work. And there were others like Loeffler and Frosch who were involved in isolating the virus that causes foot and mouth disease in cows. And these early researchers, they, they were trying anything and everything to try to pinpoint the causes of these diseases. And they found that when they took infectious fluids from a host animal and passed it through a porcelain filter that was designed to catch bacterial cells, that the filtrate that came out the other side was still infectious, even though they couldn't see the infectious agent with a microscope. And it was over a number of decades that experimentation led scientists to kind of give shape to what a virus was. They were determined to be non-cellular particles that had a definite size, shape, as well as chemical composition. And to this day, there is quite a large amount of mystery still involved in the study of virology. Uh, there's not a universal agreement on how and when viruses originated, but it's clear that they've been around for billions of years. They are the most abundant microbes on the planet, and they were involved in the evolution of bacteria, archaea, as well as eukarya. And viruses are obligate intracellular parasites of bacteria, protozoans, fungi, algae, plants, and animals. They are what's considered ultra microscopic in size, and their size range, it goes from 20 nanometers 
all the way up to 40 nanometers in diameter. Uh, we said before that they're acellular. They're not cellular. They have a very compact structure. And even though there is some disagreement amongst biologists about whether they're truly living or not, it is clear that they do not possess all of the characteristics of living things. So technically, even though viruses possess some of the characteristics of living things, they don't possess all of those characteristics. So this information from the previous slide and the current slide is in table 6.1 in your book. And it is a good place to go to look at a summary of the properties of viruses. Um, the macromolecules of viruses are inactive when they're not inside of a host cell and they're active when they are inside of a host cell. Their basic structure consists of a protein shell called a capsid that is surrounding a nucleic acid core. The nucleic acid in viruses can be DNA or RNA, but does not include both. And then the nucleic acid of a virus can be double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, or double-stranded RNA. So there's a variety there. And then there are molecules on the surfaces of viruses that give the virus a specificity for what type of host cells it can attach to. Okay, so this is the last part of the table. Viruses, and this is part of what makes them be classified as non-living, is that the way they multiply or create more viral bodies is by using the infrastructure of the host cell and using that to assemble new viral bodies. They also lack the enzymes needed to carry out most metabolic processes or to catalyze most biological reactions. And they also don't have the necessary structures in order to make proteins. Viruses are ultra microscopic in size. Most of them are less than 0.2 micrometers in diameter. So a, an electron microscope in combination with um, specialized stains is usually how they are viewed. The largest viruses can be 500 to 1,000 nanometers, which is 20 to 50 times larger than the average virus, and those are megaviruses and pandaviruses. This is a picture showing um, a megavirus, and it's using a transmission electron microscope, and it's just one viral particle. And you can kind of see the this darker part in the center is the DNA core, this lighter ring around it, that's the protein capsid, and then it has little surface fibrils around it and these viruses would be actually large enough to be visible using a regular light microscope so you know the general structure of viruses are not similar to cells they they don't have the machinery to make proteins they contain only what they need in order to invade or get inside of the host cell and to control the host cell to have it create new viral bodies. And we talked about the, a virus particle. It has a covering um, called the capsid. Some, but not all viruses have envelopes outside of the capsid. And then the central core of the virus is gonna be where the DNA or RNA is found. And so sometimes you will also find matrix proteins, which are enzymes, but they're not in all viruses either. So in general, the virus, the viral structure has a crystalline nature and the molecular structure is just regular repeating molecules that, and that's what makes them look like, look crystalline. And so when viruses are purified, they can form large aggregates of crystals. All viruses have capsids, which is that protein coat that encloses and protects the nucleic acid. 
And so if you include the capsid with the nucleic acid, that's called a nucleocapsid. And then some viruses have that external covering on the outside of the capsid called an envelope. And if you have a virus that has an envelope, it's called enveloped. A virus that doesn't have an envelope is called naked. Every capsid of a virus is made of identical protein subunits. Those are called capsomers. So the units making up a capsid are called capsomers. This is a naked nucleocapsid virus. So it has the protein capsid, but no envelope and then it has the internal nucleic acid. This is an enveloped virus. So on this particular virus, you have the protein capsid, the nucleic acid core, and then you have this envelope, this protective envelope surrounding the virus. And this is from figure 6.4 in your book. Okay, so there are two different types of capsids in terms of their structure um, or their shape or morphology. There's a helical capsid and an icosahedral capsid. A helical capsid is just a continuous helix or spiral of capsomers that makes a cylindrical nucleocapsid. An icosahedral capsid is a three-dimensional polygon that is symmetrical that has 20 sides and 12 evenly spaced corners, okay? So when it comes to the nucleocapsid, there are rod-shaped capsomers, those are the subunits that assemble into hollow discs. And then the nucleic acid is inserted into the center of the disc. The elongation of the nucleocapsid happens at both ends as the nucleo nucleic acid is coiled in the middle. So this is both a, an electron microscope view and a schematic of an enveloped helical virus, influenza virus. And this is, you can tell this part in the center that's helical with the, um, the this is the helical nucleocapsid. And then you can see a very well-developed envelope surrounding it. The arrangement of the capsomers in the capsid of icosahedral viruses can have a wide variation. And they can also be varied in the number of capsomers included in the capsid. So during the putting together or assembly of an icosahedral virus, the nucleic acid is packed into the center of the polygon or the icosahedron forming the nucleocapsid. And this picture is showing the icosahedral shape and you can see it better in this drawing here. You have your sides here and then this is a schematic of the exterior of it. And you can see the capsomers here in blue, the repeating capsomers. And then you can see these fibrils or fibrous spikes. And there's a spike everywhere that there is a vertex, there's a spike. And this is an electron microscope image of it. And you can see that it's using a negative stain, which allows you to see the texture and then some of these fibers that have actually fallen off of the virus itself. And icosahedral capsids can be naked or enveloped. Rotavirus is an example of a naked virus. And then herpes simplex is an example of an enveloped icosahedral virus. As far as the capsid and the envelope, they're protective of the nucleic acid uh, when the virus is not inside of the host cell. It also helps the virus to bind to cell surfaces and help for the virus to get its DNA or RNA inside of the host cell. In the next lecture, we're going to get into the general structure of viruses, complex viruses, as well as we will start talking about how viruses are classified and named and talk about viral multiplication.